Primarch Rogaldor of the Imperial Fists, the Arch Betrayer. This is the history and legacy of Dorne's betrayal. In the closing years of the 31st millennium, the Emperor's great crusade to reunite humanity under his banner was continuing apace. Vast expeditionary armies, spearheaded by his Primarch sons, surged out across the galaxy, bringing enlightenment and compliance wherever they went. The future seemed assured, and during a mighty celebration on Ulano, the Emperor announced that he would return to Terra, and that Horus, Primarch of the Lunar Wars, would command the Great Crusade in his stead. Some say that this event was where the seeds of disaffection were planted amongst the Primarchs, with one of their number being so publicly elevated above the rest. In truth, the rot had started long before. After the Ulanor Declaration, the cracks began to appear. Bitter disputes over the use of psychic powers came to a head at Nikea, with legions vehemently split over their use. The Emperor's final ruling and the special concessions he gave to the Thousand Sons enraged Lehman Russ and his space wolves. They saw Nikea as a terrible mistake and secretly vowed to save the Emperor from himself. On the feral world of Davin, Warmaster Horus was struck down by a mysterious contagion which baffled the finest of the Legion's apothecaries. During his recovery, Horus attended an initiation ceremony of one of Davin's primitive warrior lodges, after which the Warmaster's condition dramatically worsened to critical. That a Primarch could succumb to any natural pathogen should have given a hint that what happened in the Halls of the Knife of Bone involved the supernatural. It was in fact an act of possession by a powerful warp entity, although at the time, the concept of the demonic was widely regarded as errant superstition. Only with the aid of the might of the blind Primarch of the Thousand Suns and the spiritual counseling from Chaplain Erebus of the Word Bearers, could the entity finally be cast out? So with the Warmaster having escaped their snare, the ruinous powers turned their attentions elsewhere. The ordeal revealed to the Warmaster the true dangers of chaos, a power so great that even he and his fellow Primarchs were not immune to its corrupting touch. Horus was severely weakened by the events of Davin and out of positions to deal with what was to come. First, Conrad Kerrs of the Night Wars Legion attacked Rogel Dorn before going on the run with his Legion. Worse still, word came from the Galactic East that Gilliman had declared independence from the Imperium, claiming dominion over a massive region of space that he called Ultramar Segmentum. Even as the Imperial forces assembled to confront the Ultramarines, Terrible news came from Prospero that the Space Wolves had fallen upon the homeworld of the Thousand Suns. They proclaimed Magnus was mired in foul sorcery and sought to destroy them before they could betray the Emperor. With the dream of the Emperor coming apart at the seams, the legions came into high orbit around Istvan V. Gilliman and the lion's share of his massive Ultramarines Legion were identified as being present at his newest conquest, the fifth planet of the Estvan system. This was said to be the place that the Imperium would crush the rebellious Primarch and his dreams of an independent domain. With Horus still recovering after Davin, Rogel Dorn used his position as the Emperor's Praetorian to take command of the forces congregating around Istvan. The Ultramarines were by far the most numerous legion, in large part due to Gilliman's organizational skills, and so a suitably overwhelming force was assembled in opposition. Dorn summoned the might of nearly half the Emperor's legions to the task. Although offers of forces from the longtime rival Percherabo of the Iron Warriors were pointedly refused. 
Such was the size of the task of bringing the secessionist realm back to heal that two whole legions were sent deep into Ultramar Segmentum. The Alpha Legion, never friends of the Ultramarines, were to infiltrate and undermine the rebel worlds, while the religious zealots of the word bearers used a more direct approach, bringing the light of the Emperor to the very core of Gilliman's power base on the Eastern Fringe. The first to join the Imperial Fist Fleet outside the Estvan system were the Raven Guard and the increasingly insular and secretive Marines of the Iron Hands. These were closely followed by the Salamanders, led by their burned, bitter Primarch. Shortly after came the Emperor's children from the fresh extinguishing the Xenos threat from the planet's lair. The events of that campaign had affected Fulgrim deeply, and on arrival he declared that his legion had achieved the pinnacle of the Emperor's perfection. The relish with which they embraced the chance to prove their superiority over other Astartes bordered on the unseemly. Then, in precise, well-ordered formation, came Angron's world eaters. Long gone was the savage gladiator mentality of Angron's early years. His first meeting with the Emperor on the slopes of Pedon Moor had seen him reject his former brutality as the impetuosity of youth. The final force to break from the warp was composed of vessels belonging to the Dark Angels, whose arrival came as a surprise. When Lionel Johnson himself had sent word that they would not be able to return in time from their assignment among the ghoul stars. It was explained that the force had arrived directly from their homeworld of Caliban and Lufer. The legion's second in command was welcomed into the burgeoning fleet. On the eve of battle, Dorne went down to the planet's surface under the flag of truce to speak to Gilliman. On his return, he gravely reported that no peaceful solution was possible, but that he had taken the opportunity to view the defenses and had formulated a plan to crack them wide open. Knowing Dorne's tactical expertise at siege warfare, no one questioned the wisdom of his plan. The Imperial Fists, Dark Angels, Salamanders and the Iron Hands made planet fall first. Their stated intention was to draw an ever-tightening ring of steel around Gilliman, so that the Raven Guard, World Eaters, and the Emperor's children would be able to sweep in from orbit and land the crushing blow. Instead of the pressurized, demoralized opponents Dorne had predicted, the second wave found the drop zones to be heavily fortified killing grounds, well garrisoned by the Ultramarines, the three legions took horrendous losses, fighting their way back to link up with their allies, only for their supposed brothers to open fire on them in an act of base treachery, in the greatest betrayal and military disaster the Legione Astartes had ever faced. The Imperial Fists, Dark Angels, Iron Hands and the Salamanders decimated the survivors of the planet fall. It was only the timely intervention of the cruiser Eisenstein, which had commandeered by loyalists among the Turncoat forces, which allowed even a small percentage of the ambushed legions to fight their way back into orbit and escape. When Horus had slipped from their clutches, the ruinous powers had moved to groom another for the role of Archbetrayer. True, they had been able to corrupt other Primarchs, but Rogel Dorn was chosen for his potential to bring the entire Imperium crashing down. They preyed upon and magnified his feelings of jealousy as being passed over as War Master and then being withdrawn to Terra while his brothers were carving a reputation across the galaxy. Feeling revulsion at such thoughts, Dorn had sought to drown out these shameful doubts of his father's judgment in the scourge of the Pain Glove. As the pressure increased, 
he spent longer and longer in the device until eventually it unhinged his mind and he was claimed by the pantheon of chaos. He was not beholden to one, but to the glory of chaos undivided. Ultramar Segmentum's neutrality in the heresy had been bought with the blood of three loyal legions, and as agreed, the traitors left Gilliman and his realm. The chaos powers had not even needed to corrupt Gilliman to split him from the emperor. His pride and the need to entrench his position was enough to ensure temporary quiescence. The Imperial Fists, Salamanders and Iron Hands headed to the Soul System to tighten their grip on Terra, while Luther and his Dark Angels went to rendezvous with their brothers under Lionel Johnson on Caliban. What occurred on the Dark Angel homeworld is unrecorded by Imperial history except that it ended with the utter destruction of the planet. The space walls that left the ruins of Prospero and set course for a Terra were a much changed breed. Although they arrived, believing that they were protecting the Imperium, the ferocity of their battle with the Thousand Suns stripped away their veneer of righteousness. By the end, the Space Wolf Legion had been baptized in blood and anointed into the overt worship of Korn, the Blood God. The events of Istvan had revealed the third of the Legio and Astartes as traitors to the Emperor, with five loyal legions left either effectively destroyed or entangled on the other side of the galaxy in an interminable conflict. With the news growing worse by the day, the remaining loyalist legions scrambled to get back to Terra and to save the Emperor. With Dorne's betrayal on Istvan prematurely revealed, the Emperor and his custodians were able to seal themselves off inside the Imperial Throne Room complex. Dorne's intention had been to quietly dispose of the legions he could not corrupt and then returned to the palace before his treachery was discovered to deal with his father. Dorn, however, had allowed for this eventuality, as the Emperor's Praetorium, a portion of his legion, garrisoned the Imperial Palace, and when the time came, guards became jailers, trapping the Emperor and his custodians within the armored bunker of the Imperial throne room. Dorn's grip upon Terra was tightened, as according to his plan, the Blood Angel's fleet broke from the warp. What emerged from the landing craft at the Eternity Wall spaceport were not the proud red armored sons of Baal, but gaunt, diseased creatures who felt upon the terrified defenders to feast upon their blood. The Legion had fallen prey to some form of malady that first rotted their blood, forcing them to take fresh stocks from unwilling victims, and in the process ate away at their sanity and loyalty to the Emperor. A ray of hope came from the embattled defenders as the mercurial night lords appeared from nowhere. Nothing had been heard from the Legion since their Primarch, Conrad Kurz, had physically attacked Dorne and taking his followers into hiding. Once more, the Night Lord fought Imperial Fist, but this time, the reason for it was clear. Characteristic of the Night Hunter's favorite tactics, the battle through the Imperial Palace was brutal and swift. Then, without warning, they withdrew to take the fight elsewhere, across Terra. This respite was short-lived, Though as within days, the Arch-Betrayer, Dorn, arrived back from Istvan in force, along with the Salamanders. The Iron Hands moved to secure Mars for the Rebellion, silencing all word from the Adeptus Mechanicus and their Titan legions. Shortly after, the fleets of the Sons of Horus and the Iron Warriors battered their way through the blockade to make Planetfall before encircling the Imperial Palace in a counter-siege. This forced the Imperial Fist to defend the outer walls of the palace at the same time 
they try to break into the heavily fortified throne room. The combination of the War Master's cold fury and Perturabu's siegecraft slowed Dorne's progress towards the Emperor. In those bloody days, the war hung in the balance, with neither side being able to land the fatal blow, with the Iron Hands incommunicado seemingly following their own agenda on Mars, and the renegade space walls and dark angels unaccountably slow to a crawl in the war. Dorn turned ever more towards the demonic to win the war. Through foul sorceries and blood pacts, Terra became a playground for all manner of entities from the Empyrean. To try to crush the resistance, Dorn dispatched units of possessed Imperial fists and the plague-ridden blood angels across the globe using a sky fortress. But still, the civilian uprising grew apace. The loyalists, however, had their own troubles. The Death Guard were stranded on the other side of the galaxy, having been ambushed by Eldar raiders, which had left their war pensions wrecked and their navigators dead. The White Scars were thought lost in the warp, having not been heard from since their first astropathic recall. At any other time, the palace's great Cassia spell would have rung out 10,000 times in mourning, but in such blood-soaked days, even a lost legion would have to wait for a proper remembrance. By the 55th day of the siege, the Iron Warriors had broken through the ultimate gates. Perturabo himself led the assault that he fervently hoped would bring him face to face with Dorn. As the mighty gates were blasted open, it was not Dorn that defended them, but Sanguinius of the Blood Angels, skin pocked and welted, his once white feather wings now balding and his slicked with necrotic pus. As the two brothers fought, the wider battlefield grew still, all eyes fixed upon the epic clash as they traded blows that would have crippled lesser beings. In the end, Sanguinius hefted the stunned Perturaba aloft and brought him down across his knee, breaking his spine. Sanguinius then took flight, carrying his dying brother into the air and drained him of blood. As the ultimate gate was bulldozed, Shot once more by the defenders, Sanguinius contemptuously threw the corpse back down at the broken Iron Warriors. As it transpired, the ultimate gate was never assaulted again, and within a day, Dorn brushed the adamantium walls of the throne room. What he found, however, drove him to a fury. The Emperor was long gone, spirited away by the Night Lord at the start of the siege, while chaos had focused its attention upon the throne room. The Emperor had used the time to organize resistance across Terra. The skeleton force of custodies that had remained to maintain the illusion bore the brunt of Dorne's anger. Despite the sternest assertions from Horus that he must leave Terra, the Emperor flatly refused. He had spent the whole of his long lifetime battling to unite Terra and mankind, and had fought at the forefront of the Great Crusade. He would not be driven away from his own planet. He also had a plan. In the time since his rescue by the Night Lords, he had been working to this end, and just after the death of Perturabo, the Emperor completed his modifications and bonded a portion of his consciousness with the Astronomicon. In an instant, the warp influence weakened planet-wide, with whole legions of lesser entities banished from the physical realm. The rebellion was wounded, but not finished. Then, beyond all expectation, the White Scars had arrived. Though lost, their ships filled the calm channels with disturbing, discordant harmonics before sweeping down into the embattled Lion's Gate spaceport. They murdered the Imperial Defenders, and without even fortifying their positions, the corrupted White Scars took to their vehicles and scattered across the planet at high speed to make sport with the cowering civilian population. 
with another fresh legion throwing its weight behind the traitors and the fleet of the Dark Angels as space walls only days away. The Emperor had no choice but to cut out the heresy at its source. He and his finest troops prepared to board the Phalanx and destroy the Arch Betrayer, Dorn, on his own battle. As soon as the Emperor announced his decision to board the Phalanx, Kurz appeared from the shadows and volunteered his services. It was known that the Night Lord Primarch was cruel to prophetic visions, often of the worst possible fates, and yet even to the Emperor, he rarely spoke of what he saw. It was said that these nightmares were not inevitable, and that Kurz was constantly tormented to ensure that the worst excesses of his visions would not come to pass. Before he could be asked more details of his plan, Kurz was gone, true to his word, though at the appointed hour, sensors registered an internal explosion aboard the phalanx, and the shields preventing teleportation flickered and died. The Emperor flanked by his custodians, and Horus along with his mournful of captains teleported onto the ship but were scattered across the vast command decks by the sinister magics. Called by the psychic presence of the Emperor, the Loyalists fought their way back to their leader. Horus reached the Emperor just outside of Dorne's personal sanctum to find the Primarch's Terminator armor-clad guard dead and the armored doorway already open. A wail of unutterable anguish echoed from the chamber beyond. The pair ventured inside and found the room a wreck. Fine tapestries had been ripped from the walls and Dorn was smashing the complex mechanisms of his pain glove. With the sheared adamantium haft of his personal standard, the banner awarded to him by the Emperor, the pair advanced, ready for the kill, but Horus recognized the look in his brother's eyes from his time just after the possession on Davin and urgently waved his father back. Dorn mumbled that he had been freed, that the pulse from the Astronomicon had given him enough strength to finally banish the demon. He said that he had killed his corrupted bodyguard and retreated to the Pangla to atone for his sins. Empathizing with Dorn, the War Master put aside his weapons and advanced, open-handed in friendship, to embrace his returned brother. More wary than Horus, the Emperor hung back, and as though compelled by some unexplained urge, kicked aside a fallen tapestry to reveal the brutalized corpse of Conrad Kurz. With his deception revealed, Dorn raised the broken standard pole and plunged it deep into Horus's chest. The War Master died, never realizing that he had been betrayed a second time. Spurred into action, the Emperor leapt at Dorn. The room had seen the deaths of two of his sons, and he hardened his heart to cause a third. Dorn though had been endowed with all the gifts of the ruinous powers and was a match for even the master of mankind. The two battled for what seemed like an age, but when the Mournival, led by Captain Abaddon, reached the devastated site of the battle, they found both of them broken, burned and shattered beyond aid. Dorne's heresy had been ended, but doing so had claimed the Emperor's mortal life. All that remained was an echo of his spirit that had been bound to the Astronomicon. It bade Abaddon to reclaim the bodies of the Emperor and his loyal sons, and to reunite the physical shell with what remained of his immortal soul. They fought their way off the ship with cold fury, and after the phalanx, and under the command of Sigismund stayed in orbit just long enough to collect the remaining Imperial fists. The coalition of traitors fractured and then scattered with the blood angels 
salamanders in white scars commandeering whatever vessels they could to escape. The Dark Angel fleet turned from its tearing course, and even the blood-crazed berserkers of the Space Wolves faltered before falling to fighting amongst themselves. The Emperor was brought to the Astronomicon, where his shattered, lifeless flesh was integrated with the psychic machinery of the Beacon and fed and nourished with a thousand souls a day to sustain his wavering life force. The long war to drive the traitors from the Imperium could then begin. The heresy had been averted, but amongst the many casualties had been the Imperium's manifest destiny to rule the galaxy. The Emperor's vision of a great crusade was but a memory, and although the eight traitor legions had failed to claim Terra, they were far from defeated. Gilliman's secessionist Ultramar Segmentum was only the largest and most organized of the rebellious realms. With the Emperor hovering as a ghost in the machine, the War Master and most of the loyal Primarchs scythed away. It was Abaddon who stepped forward and became the de facto leader of the Imperium. Hating his Primarch for not protecting the Emperor, he first reorganized and then renamed his legion to shun their past and to reflect their crusading future. Thus, the Black Templars were born, and just as the War Master had done before him, Abaddon proved supremely adept at manipulating the disparate parts of the Shattered Imperium back to some semblance of order. Accepting the numerical weakness of the Legio and Astartes at that time, and the vast numbers of threats and enemies they faced, Abaddon made the Black Templars the core of an overwhelming force composed of as many legions as possible. The idea was to prevent the legions becoming isolated, both so that they would not be destroyed piecemeal and that they would watch over one another to prevent any further legions falling to the ruinous powers. Initially, there was resistance to such cautious approach, especially from legions whose Primarchs had survived. However, the tragic fate of the isolated Raven Guard and the grievous losses of the Iron Warriors sustained trying to dislodge the Imperial Fists from their Iron Cage worlds reinforced the wisdom of Abaddon's proposals. Soon, he was able to command the fealty of the surviving Primarchs and played on their individual preferences and prejudices. For instance, Mortarion would commit to a force to drive the Space Wolves from Fenris, proposed by Magnus, on the understanding that reciprocity would be observed when it came to mounting a xenocidal crusade against an Eldar craft world for Fulgrim and the Emperor's children, an attack on Gilliman deep inside Ultramar Segmentum, in revenge for Istvan was the prize, and Lorgar was pacified with the leadership of the newly formed Ecclesiarchy, and support for his legion's wars of faith. Painfully, slowly, but surely, the tide turned and the borders of Imperial control space rolled back once again. In the course of a long lifetime, Abaddon saw his patience rewarded. The remaining loyalist legions were rebuilt and expanded, and the traitor legions were pushed from their homeworlds and enclaves towards the massive warp rift which became known as the Eye of Terror. He died as he lived, leading the Imperial forces from the front. On the world of Uralan, in the shadow of a monumental tower, Abaddon was struck down by a huge, golden-skinned creature bearing an enormous blade of warp construction. The first High Lord of Terra was dead, but his philosophy would live on. After the heresy, the Imperial Fists were regarded with bitterness by the other traitors. If they had won, the Imperium would have been forced to accept the traitor legions as the heroic liberators they knew themselves to be. But Dorne's failure 
and perceived weakness had ultimately broken the rebellion, now they would forever be condemned as pariahs, worse, the ravages of extensive demonic possession and the brutal meat grinder battles of the siege had reduced the imperial fist to a shadow of their former strength. Inheritor of Dorne's mantle was Sigismund, who, to avoid the hated imperial associations, renamed them as the brooding Black Legion. Such was the bitterness surrounding the Legion that Sigismund could not expect to command the loyalty of the other traitor Primarchs. He could not even prevent elements of his own command from rebelling. Alexis Pollux led many of the possessed marines to their own fate, and these bloody-handed butchers showed even the space wolves the true meaning of savagery. Another group despised the way Sigismund had turned his back on their Primarch, proudly and defiantly, calling themselves the Scions of Dorne. They set about carving a reputation by targeting a selected great company, be they loyalist or traitor, and not resting until it had been annihilated to the last marine. The Imperium slowly pushed the traitor legions out of their traditional enclaves, and most set up bases on the hellish worlds in and around the Eye of Terror. Each seemed driven to periodically strike out from their demon worlds for spoil, pleasure, or necessity. The contagious, afflicting Sanguinius and his cadaverous blood angels grew worse over the centuries, and they were forced to raid further and further a field to provide the fresh blood and replacement organs they so desperately needed. And worst afflicted brethren were driven insane as the build-up toxins rotted their brains beyond recovery. These wretches are often grouped together and in battle herded towards their enemies. Although little more than beasts, their warp-boosted vitality, maniacal strength and inability to register pain make them more than a match for even veteran Astartes warriors. Although their homeworld of Caliban was reduced to an asteroid field, Luther and his Dark Angels have stubbornly retained a strong presence in the system. Although they have also been seen to appear from nowhere and destroy targets throughout the galaxy, the reason for these attacks has been hotly debated by Imperial strategists over 10 millennia, with theories ranging from institutionalized insanity to that they are searching for or trying to obliterate someone or something. The intentions of other traitor legions, such as the White Scars and the Space Wolves, are much clearer. The White Scars now exist only for the thrill of speed, sensation and battle, while the Space Wolves have submerged themselves wholeheartedly in the worship of Khorne. The disappearance of Lehman Russ during the purging of Fenris saw the Legion disintegrate into war bands, each competing to be the most brutal and bloodthirsty in honor of their god. The Space Wolves' attentions extend little beyond slaughter, and scant attention is given to the crafting of weapons or armor. Instead, the Space Wolves have chosen to scavenge such things from slain foes, which act both as trophies to proclaim their combat prowess and to repair the battle damage they inevitably sustain. Vulcan's nihilistic disillusionment with what he saw as the hypocrisy of the Imperium spread over the centuries to encompass his fellow traitors. He and his legion came to despise the petty excesses of the Chaos Gods and their servants and made war with both the Imperium and their fellow traitors. Their attempting burning of Scalafrax was only narrowly averted by a joint action of the newly rebuilt Emperor's children and world eaters, and this early success cemented bonds of brotherhood between them. Imperial Konseki 
have proposed that salamanders have formally aligned themselves with an aspect of the warp they call Malal, although what this means in practice is unclear. What is certain is that salamanders remain an unpredictable and dangerous foe. The actions of the Iron Hands are, if anything, even more bizarre. Other than at Istvan, the Legion has never been seen to fight alongside the forces of chaos, and it is widely believed that Manus fought there solely to further his own agenda of raiding Mars. Their objective there has remained shrouded in mystery, as they ignored priceless stores of Archaeotect instead excavate, something from deep beneath the mountains of Noctis Labyrinthus. After leaving Mars, the Iron Hands vanished, and were thought lost to history, appearing once or twice in a millennia, a coalition of confirmed sightings, usually from attacks on archaeological excavations of dead worlds, show the creeping mechanization of the body, replacing flesh with metal. Some iron hands, the so-called rubrics of Polyon, appear to revel in total mechanization. The Iron Hands only revealed themselves fully during the Gothic War, when the Legion assaulted and spirited away several of the arcane Blackstone fortresses that had formerly defended the sector. A being claiming to be Ferris Manus himself led the successful assault on Blackstone too, but if it was Manus, the fabled liquid metal that covered his hands seem to have enveloped his entire body. The Mechanicus has never been able to account for what the Iron Hands excavated from beneath the Red Sands of Mars, but as the frequency of the attacks by the Legion increases, so too does pressure for a proper explanation. To the Galactic East, Gilliman took advantage of the Anarchy of the Heresy to further cement his realm. Despite the sternious crusades and the insurrectionist actions of the Alpha Legion, the massive size, military and efficiency, and organizational ability of the Ultramarines and their offshoot successor chapters meant that any losses were swiftly reclaimed into the Ultramar fold. This has changed in recent centuries, as wars within its own borders with Xenos races have sapped their prodigious military strength. The arrival of extragalactic hive race of Tyranids was proclaimed by the Ecclesiarchy as a judgment from the Emperor, although this line of rhetoric has been dropped recently as the hive fleets have started attacking into the hearts of Segmentum Solar. As dangerous as the incursions from the Tyranids may be, they are only one of the rising threats to the Imperium. After ten millennia, it seems that the traitor legions at last seem to be putting aside their differences, that chaos should finally follow the tactics dictated by Abaddon of a mass crusade would be a terrible irony. What their intentions would be are unknown, but if the ruinous powers were to attempt a second assault on Holy Terra, the bloodshed would truly be apocalyptic. <laughs>